good? I can hear you. Okay, so yesterday's case study, rather serious in nature, without, you know, I think it was a very serious subject, but we're not here to save the children. We're here to sell some fucking toothpaste. The, uh, the word has been bandied around. We've heard it all weekend long, right? We've heard about partnerships. We've heard about relationships. But the truth is, without honest and truthful communication, they're all... Get ready for this. Bullship. See the way I did that with the ship? Yeah. What we try to do with PhD and GSK is create a partnership, a true one. And we're going to kind of walk you through how that, how that really works. And the keys that we see are communication, working with expectations, budget, and time frame. But the key is for us all to be in bed together. It's like big love, people. Get married, multiple spouses. You are. I, we are. I'm, I'm your the work thing wife. is, you have to be honest. And you hear that a lot. But the reason Kelly and I and Scott Grenz, who's not here, work together is because we're all completely transparent with everything. Right? So many of your vendors out there are coming to you with solutions. But what are those solutions? Usually some kind of like proprietary algorithm stuffed inside a black box, covered in special sauce, guarded by magical unicorns. Get down to it. We were completely honest and open with what we do, which is why Kelly was comfortable taking her or taking us to our client. Yeah, and I think that um, from an agency, agency, sorry, agency perspective, that's really important. I think um, we actually don't look at partnerships as kind of who the vendor is and who's helping us out, but they are an extension of my team. I think that's really important. I think all agencies know we're kind of lean, we're skeletal, we're missing half the buyers we need, half the supervisors. So when you enter one of these partnerships, and that's exactly what we did with the audience science team, is Sarah and the rest of the people on Will's team became an extension of my team. They're in the office, they, everything my team's told, they're told, they're on the client emails, and they have all the data in front of them. So that's really how we were able to bring this together and be successful for GSK. So let's kind of talk about it. So I, I just have a real quick question. 24 hours, in the last 24 hours, how many people here have been online? Okay, awesome, please keep your hands up. Um, keep your hands up if you were on a site about toothpaste. Oh. Come on. Well, that sucks. Did do my job. Yeah, this is clearly our challenge, right? Because nobody, well, we don't care and love toothpaste. Hopefully everybody brushed their teeth several times this morning to rid themselves of the alcohol. But it's not like buying a new car. There's no indicative behaviors of people interested in toothpaste online. That's a tough thing. You, you have behaviors and things that happen when you're buying purchases, or, you know, like a car or perhaps a camera, but not with toothpaste. So our usual tools aren't going to work, right? It's not enough. People aren't searching for information on toothpaste necessarily or reading about information or, or looking for information about their competitors. Because if you really think about toothpaste and your teeth, it's a thing you think about maybe twice a day. Maybe three times, right? You brush your teeth, and if your teeth hurt, that's when you think about it. And then you go downstairs, and you do whatever you do, and you get in your car, you go to work, and you forget about it until your teeth are killing you, right? It's not top of mind awareness. So the usual tools wouldn't work. What we had to do was sit with Kelly and with the client to really understand deeper and, and who is this target, and do some creative thinking and brainstorming and then start applying those guesses. But you know what, folks? And this is where it changes from being a vendor and a seller into a relationship, into a partnership. Because it all doesn't work right off the bat. Things don't just magically happen and you start seeing things. What are we looking for? What are we trying to find? And there were some interesting insights that came up right up front. Turns out people that eat a lot of fruit have tooth sensitivity. Turns out that people that drink a lot of coffee and a lot of tea have tooth sensitivity. But who are those people, and how are we going to find out a little bit about them? So I think this is a good place where to build on the panel that you just saw. Big data helped us, and we worked with Audience Science, and we partnered, and we did lift the hood at GSK and with our research analysts and kind of pull it out. And we said, okay, these two things seem like they should have been obvious to us, but now we have to find that person because almost everybody eats citrus fruit, drinks coffee and tea. 
So by really kind of digging into the data and partnering and really looking at what worked, what didn't work, throwing out what didn't work, adding the new piece, we really actually found who those people were. And it was quite surprising to us. And it allowed us to have an entirely different plan out of the gate than when we actually started. Yeah, I thought what Ming said here was really interesting in the last session because you don't know going in always, right? Or you have an idea. You know, we've all seen those RFPs that come out for a client, right? Um, XYZ product targets Mary. Mary is 25, 54, she lives, she's a soccer mom, she's called a sec, but that's not enough information. So it required us sitting down and l literally taking the data and ripping it apart and overlaying it time and time again to try to understand who specifically we were gonna see and who we were gonna talk to. And then on top of that, what message are we gonna send them? Because what's the ultimate metric here? When was the last time anybody here purchased some toothpaste online? You don't do it. So we're, we're hampered by a couple of things with this campaign. We're hampered by you're not looking for information. We don't know exactly who the people are. We don't know that you're going to purchase. In fact, we know that if you are going to purchase it, you're probably going to go into a store and purchase it, right? We're hampered by click is not a great metric. So we had to look at a number of things. And we do look at click. And we did look at um, site engagement. And we do look at brand lift. All those things together are going to create success for the campaign. But again. These conversations were not had five weeks into the campaign when Kelly's team would be calling my team or your team to say, hey, what's up? Why aren't we where we need to be? The communication has to, has to, has to happen up front and then is an ongoing process. It's not enough to say, how are we gonna get this by done? And what's it gonna look like? It's about constant interaction and trust. Yeah, I think that's really important there when you talk about how we didn't have the information and. And it is a hard product to go after. I mean, everybody buys toothpaste, and a lot of times it's just what the first one that you see on the aisle is. I think to that point, it wasn't five weeks in, it was in the beginning. Because what we really had to know was, from the get-go, what were we looking at, what we were doing? And we were very honest um, with audience science and the team saying, this is what we think, but we don't know. But what we do know is we have to push something off the shelf, and we have to do it pretty quickly. And it can't be a phone call in five weeks. It needs to be a phone call in 24 hours and you need to be right there with me, and you actually have to have been ready to make the phone call before I did. So it was just that collaborative piece that not only allowed us to find out a lot of the data points, but we actually learned who the person is that we were gonna go, go after, completely different than what we thought, and so that allowed the campaign to be successful. To Will's point, what were the metrics? Very hard when you're not selling something on, online. So yes, we did look at click-through, we did look at brand um, measurements in terms of lift and favorability, but the big thing we actually looked at was pulling the data looking at the collaboration and finding a new target to actually go after that allowed us to broaden that plan from there on out. And the targets that we found, it's one of those things where after we say it, you'll be like, oh, sure. Why didn't you see that up front? So who did we discover? This guy. People that don't take care of themselves have painful teeth. Not exactly an aha, but we had to do a lot of digging. Was it people that were eating a lot of candy? Was it people that were just going to meat sites, things of the nature that wouldn't necessarily jump up. You know, who's eating, who's ordering 25 pounds of meat? That guy's probably not gonna be very healthy. Those types of weird insights actually allowed us to create buckets of segments of people that we believed were unhealthy, leading an unhealthy lifestyle. Maybe it was massive amounts of hits on video game sites, things of that nature. I'm not gonna share everything with you guys here today, but those sort of insights led to us uh, uh, able to serve ads to people that we would never have thought, never have dreamed of targeting. Seniors, another huge place where again, it's an aha. Like, oh, I, I would think that that makes some sense, but let's prove it with the data. Let's come in with spreadsheets and actual facts that we can provide to the client and to Kelly to say, look, here's a market that we found that we're not really targeting, we're not spending an inordinate amount of money. And I think Ming mentioned earlier that this change is not just online, but offline. There are some pretty cool things that you can do with those types of insights. This guy, I just put it up because he looks exactly like my Uncle Joe. Thought it was fun. Lastly, people looking for help looking to change their lifestyle, looking to address some of the situations that they've occurred, uh, that have occurred in their life, became somebody that looked really strong for us to target. And once we started doing this and started going in weekly with, these are the people that we thought it was, we're pulling these people out, they look like tire kickers, they're not coming to the site, they're not doing the things that we need them, that we believe will eventually lead to purchase. We got rid of them, and we started focusing on some of these new segments, and we started to see some pretty terrific stuff. Now, as I mentioned earlier, 
neither Kelly or I are going to sit here and debate the merits of the click. Uh, that, that argument's been kicked to death. But that was one of the four or five metric tools that we utilized here to analyze this campaign. So in addition to increased site visitation, in addition to brand lift, we looked at this and we saw some pretty good stuff. We saw a pretty high increase in CTR. And I think that's really important. While we're not looking at that as the end all be all, I think everybody here is very familiar with your clients' um, media mix models. And a lot of times you're trying to figure out what it is and it's starting that funnel. So while it wasn't the only thing that we looked at, we did find that if we were sending more people to the site, going two or three pages in and engaging with whatever content was on the site, that we were obviously finding someone had a little more of a propensity to purchasing a toothpaste for sensitive teeth. Additionally on that, what was really helpful to Will's point about taking something offline is actually finding targets in terms of areas, Austin, Baltimore, New York, and Florida, that we had never even thought of actually going into a geo or into a state and kind of really doing some heavy targeting. We were more of a national type campaign, so both those pieces allowed us not only to look at the online campaign and optimize it, but then look at offline. Does that mean we should be dropping FSI in certain areas, should be having up TV, bringing in radio out of home, kind of all those different pieces were able to be pulled over a short campaign of that kind of sharing back and forth. Now the other thing that this does is this isn't the end, right? So your campaign's finished. That's just the beginning of this partnership, right? So what did we learn from this campaign that can be used for other GSK brands? In addition to Sensodyne moving forward, are there insights here? Can we create data, a data store, so to speak, for PhD to utilize for other products that GSK sells? Who in this category or who in these categories makes sense for Aquafresh? Are there insights in here that we can glean? And what we were able to do is sit with her and the brand to say, hey, here's some things that we learned and actually start to create some very easy for them to grab data elements that they know automatically this is going to get us here. This is going to give us some information that, we can, that we've already got. It's marketing from fact and starting again the whole time. Communication, communication, communication. Yeah, I don't think I can push the communication piece enough. I think that um, I've actually worked with Will now across two agencies for multiple years and his team. And I think that while these results are great and they come from a lot of work in the media space and the buy management and kind of the optimizations, I think that the first point is finding that partner and that you can actually lay everything on the table with, be completely transparent and open. And I think if they put skin in the game and you put skin in the game, this is the type of program that you're able to run versus just give me my buy so I can hit my quota or give me my media so I can tell the client, here's your buy summary. And it's a very different way of looking at it. And I think the success that came out of that, this is just one campaign that shows it. Yeah, I mean, stamping your foot and screaming for better optimization or more clicks, well, that's, do it. that's not a partnership. That's, that's something else. And that doesn't work. Um, you know, it can help you on a number of levels, partnership, right? So the insights we gain from that are able to help Kelly and her team give other information to the brand. It's also able to help Kelly and her team go to the brand and say, hey, here's what we did for you, Sensodyne. Here's maybe what we should do for you, XYZ product. But again, we came together up front, agency, client, technology, and sat down in a room. And the communication never stopped. For umpteen weeks now, we have a weekly or bi-weekly meeting with the brand, with the agency, with us talking about insights, what's next on the plate, what are we gonna learn, how are we gonna push this thing forward? And I believe transparency and communication are the key to this relationship's working. Yeah, absolutely, and I think just to go back to the first panel, how they asked, how if you're trying to sell something and get in, you have this great product, how do you get into the client? It's not necessarily the agency, but the client. I think this shows how the agency actually pulled the client in and said, you have to be speaking to this person. This is the partner that we want to bring to you. So I think making sure you're transparent and collaborative only allows the agency to feel more comfortable with allowing that next move, which is, sure, you can talk to my brand, you can talk to my client, and open up that aperture. So I think that transparency works for everybody involved. Great, that's really all we have today. Are there any questions or anything? I think we have like a minute and a half. Can't really see out there, so I'll assume we're good. Nancy, we good? Yeah, terrific, thank you so much.